I am Councillor Robin Buckman Potts. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum. I'd like to call meeting 21 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to order. Welcome, everybody. This meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology with members and staff connecting by video conference or calling in. We ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We are also providing closed captioning. A few of the usual reminders. Staff, please keep videos turned off until you need to speak or answer questions. This makes it easier for me as the chair and those watching on YouTube to observe the meeting. Members and staff, please keep your microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or speak. Members, if you wish to speak to an item, um, if you can have your video on, and if you're able to, raise your hand or unmute your mic and let me know and I will create a speakers list. When voting, if you can have your video on, and if you are able to, raise your hand or unmute your mic to indicate your vote. And if you have any motions on agenda items, please submit them in writing to the clerk. The clerk staff are available by email at taac at toronto.ca. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations including Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 within the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please unmute your mic and let me know. Anderson speaking. I have an interest on item number DI 21.3. Uh, the nature of my interest is as follows. I'm the co founder of, uh, and executive director of the Stop Gap Foundation. We're an advocacy organization that provides interim entry ramps, uh, like the ones discussed as part of this item. So we provide these uh, interim access ramps to community members and and businesses on a on a cost recovery basis. That's my declaration of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. So noted. Next, we need a motion to confirm the minutes from the last meeting on May fifth, twenty twenty. Do I have anyone to move it? Uh, moved by Howard. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Before we get into the agenda, I'd like to say that I'm pleased to be here as your newest member and chair for the last meeting of this council term. For those of you I have not met, prior to my appointment as councillor, I was the former councillor, Chris and Wong Tam's chief of staff. As I said, my name is Robin Buxton Potts, and it is my complete honor to serve with you. To begin, I want to position a few of my identities as they relate to this committee. Uh, I am a queer, neurodivergent, femme presenting person. My pronouns are she, they. I'm also white, able bodied. I have the privilege of financial comfort and formal education. I want to acknowledge that these are the biases that I filter the world through, and I'm continuing to learn and listen. So I invite correction when my language or perspective is harmful. As this is the last meeting of the term, I also want to share my immense gratitude to all the members of the committee. Your shared expertise has had a real impact on the governance of this city, and I hope you're all proud of the contribution you've made. I think this is one of the most productive advisory committees in the city, and your work has impacted policy on everything from our remote work policies to the vaccine rollout, um, election planning, and our transportation policies. Lastly, I want to give a very special congratulations to our former chair, um, MPP-elect Kristen Wong-Tam, on their election to the provincial legislature. I know how important this committee is to them, and I'm confident that they will continue to take um, and learn and lean on all of your advice and expertise at the province to, make a builder, to build a better province for us all. Let's proceed with the agenda. We have a lot to get through today, and we aim to complete the agenda by 1230. So I'm going to ask all presenters to be as succinct as possible and try to keep within time frames. There are six items and we will consider items in the order listed. 
Our first item is D1 21.1 Automated Micro Utility Devices Accessibility Feedback. This item was deferred from the last meeting, and as noted in the letter I submitted, we have learned that the staff report on automated micro utility devices will not be submitted to committee and council until 2023. Based on that, it is more appropriate for the committee to provide feedback in conjunction with the report at that time. Therefore, if the committee agrees, I'd like to move my motion now, as set out in my letter, to refer the item back to staff. Um, are there any questions from committee members? Seeing none. Great, so uh, I would like to move the motion to refer the item. Clerks will display it on the screen and I will read it out. The Toronto Accessible Advisory Committee refer item D121.1 to the General Manager, Transportation Services, with the request that an updated presentation be provided to the committee in 2023 to allow for accessibility feedback to be provided with the staff report that will be submitted to City Council. All those in favor? Any opposed? None, the motion is carried. The next item is D121.2, follow up on 2022 election accessibility plan. This is a report from the city clerk with an update to, uh, that the committee requested at the last meeting. The report was circulated last week and hopefully everyone has had a chance to review it. Fiona Murray, the Deputy City Clerk, Election Services, is here to answer questions. Uh, members, do you have any questions for Fiona? I see Ashley. Uh, yeah. Uh, am I on okay there? Is that all right? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Okay, sorry about that. Just want to check. I'm just wondering, uh, has any sort of uh, feedback come back with particular incidents that maybe we were made aware of, or people at the polling booth uh, were made aware of that perhaps raised issues that uh, we uh, did not cover in terms of the accessibility? I'm just wondering across the city. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm not aware of any issues that arose from the 2018 election related to accessibility, accessibility in the voting places. So there was no, just feeling it, there was no, just a follow up. There was no uh, organization uh, like Autism Ontario or uh, Learning Disability or anything like that uh, that brought any sort of issues to the attention from any of the organizations that represent a specific uh, diagnosed community. I am not aware that any organization raised concerns uh, with accessibility issues in the voting places from 2018, no. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Ashley. Are there any other questions for Fiona? Yep, yeah, Wendy. Hi there, thank you. Um, so just I'm trying to understand the structure here. So there's no presentation from the staff member. We're just, we're expected to have read the report and we're, we're asking questions of the report now, just to clarify. That's correct. Okay, so I do have some questions and based on, on the report that was submitted. Um, I wonder if you could clarify for me what kinds of supports individuals who relied on the um, at home voting program are going to be provided with to support their participation in the mail-in voting program because it I think that the crux of what the concerns I current I currently have with the program is that there are at least I think it's 350 something people who relied on that program to vote previously and the point was that that was a good program for them because they were uh, by virtue of their disability limited in their capacity to get out to vote. And so the replacement of that program with a mail-in voting program is problematic to me because it still requires somebody to be able to get out to submit their mail-in vote. So 
you know, the report does say that there'll be some assistance provided, but it doesn't clarify what that assistance would be that would actually address the problem. So I wonder if you could just uh, elucidate that a little bit for me, please. Sure, absolutely. So um, if we have an individual who uh, is struggling to use the application, for example, in order to apply to vote by mail, uh, we have a call center and our call center agents have all been trained on providing help desk support. Uh, we certainly developed a mail-in voting application with accessibility in mind. Uh, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible. But if someone is struggling to use the application to apply, then they have a contact center that will help provide help desk support so that they can make the application. So that would be the first type of assistance uh, that we could provide if someone needed it. Um, if we have an elector that uh, is not able to leave their home to drop their mail-in ballot into a mailbox, um, then we will actually send uh, election staff to go and pick it up um, in those circumstances. And then the third um, kind of assistance may be if we have an elector who is going to vote by mail, but uh, requires assistance to actually mark the mail-in ballot, then again, uh, we they could call our contact center and uh, we would send staff to provide that level of assistance in those circumstances. Go ahead, Wendy. So in terms of the call center, how is somebody who is deaf going to communicate these needs to, to the city? We have a TTY line through 311 to assist um, hard of hearing electors. I'm really, I'm, I'm really struggling because I, I don't understand why a program that had uptake has been replaced entirely. So, you know, TTY, not many deaf people actually use TTY anymore. I don't know if, if that, and it's certainly not their primary language, which is American Sign Language. Um, so I guess just to clarify, if somebody has difficult, difficulty with any of the options that you have provided in terms of mail-in voting, there is a call center that they should get in touch with, and they can ask for someone to come out and help them mark the ballot, and then somebody will also be able to take it away for them. Uh, that that's cor that's correct. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a, a quick question as well. I'm wondering if the city has um, how many polling stations we're expecting to have. Um, just I know that uh, provincially there was quite a few uh, less this recent election. Um, and just wanted to make sure that there are polling stations um, accessible to everyone that are close to their homes. Um, sure. So right now we're roughly estimating uh, around 1,500 voting locations across the city. Uh, that number often can um, increase slightly uh, the closer we get to election day. We monitor all the new development in the city, including new occupancy. So we're constantly sort of relooking at our subdivision populations to ensure that each poll uh, can serve that population effectively and that we're not getting into lineup situation. So right now we're averaging uh, roughly about 1,500 voting locations. Thank you. And is that um, on par with uh, past elections? It's a little bit lower than past elections, to be honest. We did do a review of our voting locations and we had um, some voting locations in predominantly uh, condominiums in the lobbies that were not well attended and uh, had very few electors going to them. A lot of the condo dwellers were actually going to their main poll just down the street rather than using their own building, maybe doing that kind of on their way home from work. Uh, so we did collapse some very small uh, condo specific polls into some of the larger polls that are still within uh, a fairly short distance radius from someone's home. Thank you. Are there any other questions from committee members? Yep. Ashley? Uh, 
Ashley, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't hear you. Is that better? That's no? great. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. All right. I'm wondering if a person comes to a polling booth and they have, for example, a language barrier, okay, if maybe it's their first time voting and they're, you know, uh, uh, you know, as a Canadian citizen, so their language is maybe uh, not uh, perfected. It's their first time, so I'm sure they're apprehensive. Uh, and they also have got, for example, uh, a disability. Let's say that they are hearing impaired or deaf. Um, the polling booth person obviously would not know that unless there had been some sort of a, a you know, a, a pre, you know, notification. So I'm wondering, like, what happens? when the person arrives in that situation, didn't know that they had to do anything different or whatever. How is that handled so that the person can still uh, be counted in their vote? Can you tell me that those kind of like, they're very rare, but I just wanted to know how is polling staff told to react or to handle that situation? I'm gonna ask my uh, colleague, Carol, uh, to answer that question. Okay. Good morning, I'm Carol Boganum, and I'm with the operations uh, unit within elections. Um, I'm just going to speak to the multiple language uh, translations we have in the voting place. Um, so for each voting location, we have a translated how to vote booklet. It is translated in over 25 languages and it's based on the bylaw from the city in terms of any uh, ward that has more than 2% of a language spoken, we translate into that language. We also um, assign voting place staff with multiple uh, languages that have English, um, English plus uh, an, an alternative language to voting locations where uh, a language is most spoken. Um, we also have available the language line that election staff, if they're finding that someone has a barrier to participation, they can call into the language line and a translator will be included into the conversation and can help facilitate the vote for the election. So that would include... Uh, um, and if I could add, uh, we also, anyone who has uh, a second language, we provide a sticker with a welcome and it also identifies the language that they speak, if they speak multiple languages, just to uh, allow electors uh, sort of a visual if 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 required or or staff to know who speaks multiple languages and they can be guided over to those uh, election officials. That's so then Carol, that would include uh, Braille as well. Is that correct? Can you hear me? Carol, we can't hear you. Okay. I guess when I turn my video on, the sound goes off. So let's just go with the fact that I was going to say, does does it include uh, Braille and uh, was the question? As one of the languages, does it include Braille? Yes, um, the, the How to Vote booklet includes a Braille version of uh, the instructions as well. So in the training of the polling staff, and they are uh, well aware of all the the uh, diversity of the voters, yes? Correct. And there's also uh, accessibility training for all election officials and a handbook that they take with them to the voting place to assist them when serving electors. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. Yep. If there are no other questions, uh, may I ask someone to move the item be received for information? I'll move it. Oh, apologies, Wendy, did you have another question? No, but I was hoping to have an opportunity just to speak to the item. You're right, I apologize, I missed that. Um, I will now open the floor to comments. Wendy, why don't you go first? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I appreciate at least that there has been some planning for how the folks that relied on the at-home voting program can be accommodated in the context of this election with the program itself being um, cancelled. Uh, but I, 
it, because that is something that we didn't see the last time we heard uh, about this cancellation of the program uh, at our previous meeting. And certainly, you know, this is critical. We're talking about somebody's right to vote and whether or not they're actually enabled uh, in a way that works for them to be able to to show to influence democracy, right? So we're talking about fundamental rights here. I'm I am very disappointed that uh, we've taken a program that clearly worked for 350 plus people in the city of Toronto who are at risk of not voting because of their disabilities and because they're not able to get out very easily. And we've replaced it with, you know, assurances that if they make a call to a call center, that somebody's going to help them. We're not sure what the timelines are in terms of, you know, how quickly they're going to be followed up on. We don't know, based on this presentation on the report, who it is that's going to follow up on them. We don't know what the, we don't know what the interpretation of help is. We don't know, you know, in what situations help will be provided or not provided. We also don't know what uh, individuals who contact the call center are supposed to do in the event that their request is either denied or not adequately acted on. And so all of those things presumably existed in the context of the program that this is being replaced by. And I think it's a really poor choice, frankly. I'm actually quite upset about this. I think it's a really poor choice to take a program that worked and to replace it with something that is very vague and unclear. And, you know, particularly related to voting, which is a fundamental right we all have. So uh, I, I just wanted to express my, you know, thank you for explaining to us what the alternative is. But I really don't think that it's uh, adequate. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Are there any other comments on the item? Ashley? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Usually you know, further to what Wendy said, when something works, you know, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, it, use the old expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, you, you don't need to fix it if it's already working, if it's not broke. So if it was a program that was successful, and I think that's what we on the committee obviously tried to do is to work with city staff in making uh, life more accessible. That's what it's all about. So I guess I would uh, kind of like side there with Wendy in terms of kind of like being a lot of consternation about the fact of why uh, it seems not to be not to have been con continued when you know it was established so again i'll just i'll just say that that certainly leads me to ponder rather uh, you know you know uh, const with a lot of consternation so I, I will just add my my talk there or my oh, thank you thank you ashley um, now, I was made aware that there is a last minute uh, member of the public who has requested to speak on this item. Um, with the committee's indulgence, I just wanted to see if you are comfortable having uh, a member of the public speak to this before we move on. Great. Um, clerk, can you confirm that our speaker, Miguel Avila, is ready to proceed? I can see Miguel's name on the console, Madam Chair. Miguel, can you do a sound check for us? Hello, everybody. Good morning. He's there. Welcome, Miguel. You have five minutes to speak. When you're getting close to the end of your time, I will let you know. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Councillor Robin. It's good to see you today, uh, being part of this Committee of Disability and Access for the City of Toronto. I have been speaking at this committee for the last 12 years, and I'm fully aware of the rules of, uh, of, of the meetings. I just want to let you know that eight people right now are watching this YouTube video, and we're trying to encourage our community to vote. You know, we address always the issues about accessibility barriers. I want to tell you one experience that happened to me last week. I mean, last month. Mr. John Tory was allowed to speak. And guess what? I was a registered deputy to speak to this committee. And it appears on the fly, on the switch, my time to speak was put at the end. And then members of this uh, committee were allowed to ask questions to the mayor. You know, my friends, 
That is not how we are going to be engaging people for democracy, to get out to vote, because they realize, my goodness, how is it possible that a disabled man already registered to speak was not allowed to speak right after the mayor? Because my comments were aimed and directed at this accessibility committee for the mayor to understand as he launches his new term, third term as mayor for the city of Toronto. He needs to understand that the, the term affordable rent is not what he thinks it is for us who live on, on a meager ODSP paycheck. And 80% of people living on ODSP doesn't qualify, they're not on social housing. A few minority, a few minority, 20% had access to social housing units. And we need to approach this as a crisis. I spoke last week at the city executive and I told the mayor, we need to change that definition by changing the term to rent, gear, to income, housing opportunities specifically for disabled people and indigenous. Uh, a, a, a huge majority of indigenous people are disabled. So please, I know a, a friend of mine whose name is uh, Davin. He is in a basement right now. He's in a wheelchair. He's, he's indigenous. He doesn't have a ramp to get out of the, the apartment. His wife needs to carry him up yeah. and down. And that is a, the crisis that we have in this city, that the lack of accessible housing for people with disabilities. And I would like to speak, if someone can talk to me, me, me after online, offline, and I speak to him, to you guys, about the experience of my brother, Kev, Devin. He, he needs an extra wheelchair to help him to move around the city. And plus, he is a veteran of the Canadian forces. So he has served well his country, and he deserves to have housing. So again, please, members, I'm a bit ashamed, disappointed that no one here raised their hand and said, wait, wait a minute, who ordered the change of paper? We normally ask questions later after the deputy has finished. It is shameful that no one raised their hand and says, we know Miguel. We know he's on the line, and we should uh, he, allow, allow him first to speak, and then we could uh, ask him questions as normal we do here at City Hall. And I spoke to the ombudsman, <laughs> and the ombudsman, ombudsman told me, hey, they can do whatever they want, dude. <laughs> so, see, uh, coming to elections, how do we encourage people to speak? The answer is, I don't want to vote because politicians lie. They, do, they never promise what they told us when they come to knock on the door. So we have to be honest with ourselves and lead by preaching, not by shouting the voices of disabled people. As I said before, uh, on my World 13 presentation where Councillor Robin was in attendance, discrimination, I mean, disability will never stop me. Never. But discrimination can. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. That was excellent, right on your five minutes. Um, members, do you have any questions for our speaker? Amen. Thank you so much for addressing the committee today, Miguel. You're welcome. Uh, if there are no other comments or questions, may I ask that someone move that this item be received for information? Howard, I saw your hand first. All those in favor? Any opposed? Being none, carried. The next item is D121.3, storefront entry ramps on the public right of way, accessibility feedback. Um, just as a reminder, Luke, this is the item that you declared an interest on, so we'll wait until you have turned your video off. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and we have a uh, presentation from staff, Ryan. 
Yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Sophia Lee will be sharing her screen for the presentation. Uh, we'll be jointly presenting this morning. Uh, so thank you, committees, uh, committee members, for having us here. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Ryan Lanyon. I'm the Manager of Strategic Policy and Innovation in the Transportation Services Division. And I'm joined today by Sophia Lee from the University Health Network. And I'll, I'll uh, let her introduce herself a, a bit further into the presentation. So, uh, Sophia, if you could please advance to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to give just a really brief over uh, background uh, overview of why we're here today, because this is an issue that uh, has some length and longevity to it. And so uh, just a bit of a refresher, talk about the TAC and Council motions that brought us here. And then uh, Sophia will speak about the research that the University Health Network has done around the um, interim ramps and their recommendations. Uh, so next, please. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, but just uh, so we're all on the same page, there are just many, many businesses in Toronto, particularly in older areas, where building entrances are not level with adjacent sidewalks, requiring some form of step up into the, the building and providing a barrier for people who are using wheelchairs or other mobility devices. Ultimately, the full solution is to have that resolved on the building side, because not only does the entrance need to be accessible, but so does the door and the interior of the store. Uh, but that's a, a long, long term horizon. And so um, ramps have been created as an interim solution to help people enter uh, businesses. And these ramps are placed on the public right of way. Uh, and some of them are removable. Some of them are permanent. Um, and they do have a potential impact on the pedestrian clearway. So they can create tripping hazards. They can be uh, obstacles for people who are using shorelining to navigate, but not in all circumstances. That's uh, It really depends on the scope and scale of the ramp, of the exact context around the storefront. Um, because some of these storefronts don't have uh, short or medium term plans to do any form of retrofitting, uh, the ramps do provide a potential interim solution. Um, unfortunately, the city doesn't have any uh, authority to require retrofitting, uh, and nor does the Ontario Building Code. It's more of a forward looking code. Next slide, please. So this slide shows two images, uh, which are really the extremes of, of the ramping necessary uh, on the public right of way to provide an accessible storefront entrance. So on the left, we have a ramp that has a, a 90 degree bend in it. Um, it elevates at least a foot, covers about two steps. Um, in this particular instance, the ramp has some snow buildup. Uh, it's a winter scene. Uh, there are railings to the ramp which provide, uh, again, a barrier or, or um, I guess a support for holding onto the ramp, but a potential barrier for turning because it is a very direct 90 degree turn. The ramp does enter into the public right of way uh, and into the pedestrian clearway, so it narrows the space that pedestrians can travel. And I believe this photo is from Young Street, where we obviously have very high pedestrian volumes. So that's probably one of the most dramatic uh, examples of ramping required to make a building entrance accessible. On the right hand side, we have another photo. It's in uh, good weather, probably spring or summer. Uh, the ramp that is required is maybe about four or five inches. Uh, so it's a, a half step or partial step up into the building entrance. The ramp itself is perhaps maybe about 12 to 16 inches long. Uh, it is in what we would call the marketing zone. There's a sandwich board at an adjacent building. The ramp doesn't extend beyond the length of that sandwich board. So there is no intrusion upon the, the pedestrian clearway uh, and very little potential tripping hazard in this example. So again, two examples of, of a very small ramp uh, that provides accessibility and a very large ramp that um, is required to meet the steep change uh, in entrance grade. Uh, next slide, please. So right now, there is a process to permit permanent ramps on the public right of way, um, pending approval of a, a building permit by the applicant. Uh, so we do allow those encroachments, but we do review them to make sure that they are uh, safe and within the space that's available. Uh, so again, that they don't impede on the pedestrian clearway. Um, so staff would undertake that review and issue a permit for the ramp um, if it's deemed appropriate. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, many of the ramps that are out on the public right away have not necessarily been through the permitting process. We we don't have exact numbers, but we suspect only a few have actually been through the, the permitting process. And our enforcement on that is only on a complaint basis. So things that are um, out there and not causing any any reason for concern and haven't been reported to the city are not enforced. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the, the motion that we're responding to, and it is from 2017. So again, quite a long time, um, and we're coming back to report now. Specifically, there were four items on this motion, and the one we're reporting back on was directed to the General Manager of Transportation Services to look at the feasibility of establishing guidelines to permit private ramps on the public right-of-way. Uh, and so we partnered with the University of Health Network to undertake that research, and Sophia will be uh, reporting back on that. The other three items, uh, I do have a little bit of an update that um, in economic development and culture, there are two grant programs. One is for facade improvements and the others for uh, interior fit ups. They estimate that about 5% of applications to those programs do include some form of improving accessibility, either through a ramp or a store interior. Uh, but there's there's no further specific numbers other than about 5% uh, of those applications do include improvements uh, for accessibility into the, the storefront. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to Sophia to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you for the introduction and also clearly out um, the um, barriers and the uh, uh, benefits that could provide by the interim uh, ramps. And I'm Sophia Lee. I'm the Partnership and Strategic Project Manager at the Kite Research Institute from University Health Network. So if you're not uh, familiar with the Kite Research Institute, it's the research arm of Toronto Institute. And uh, because uh, we are closely looking into issues related to rehabilitation, disability, and aging, um, prevent injury and disease, restore function, as well as uh, uh, enhance independency uh, and the active living. It's really our focus. And that's why we are very passionate about how we can make this city more accessible. And that's one of the reasons we also take on this task to look at feasibility of establishing a criteria and specification for the interim around. So um, we did several uh, works in order to see if we can answer this question. So first of all, we did a jurisdictional scan of North American cities because we don't want to reinvent the wheel, wheels. And if there's other city already have a good solution for this, we want to learn from them. And we also know there is a very large body of research existing on accessibility. So we look at the literature and not only just the traditional literature, we also look at what we call the gray literature, which is the government report and the website and all those informations. And so we did online review of the program and those website. And based on our search of the website, we identify uh, the North American cities that we can reach out and we have to find the contact person. And we identified a bunch of North American city we be able to survey. So we ask a question of those accessibility program administrators or coordinators about how they deal with the stepped entrance. Uh, and I'm going to um, give you some details about that. And we then hold a public sto stakeholder workshop. And we also have a scientific literature on transit access, access ramp because um, unfortunately, actually, there's really not literature uh, review on the interim ramp uh, in terms of academic research. That's why we turn our attention to the transit access ramps. So I'm going to give you some details, but due to the time limitation, I won't go into very much detail on all the work we did. So we ask questions of those uh, uh, accessibility programmer and uh, administrator and the coordinators. Uh, we give them 14 uh, questions. We actually conducted the telephone interviews. We asked them how they use the interim issues with interim and the guidelines if they have any for implementation and the design and whether they monitor and enforce the guideline and also their overall accessibility of establishment and also whether they get complaints. 
or uh, like a praise for those uh, interrupt ramp. And uh, however, uh, we have to bear in mind that the information we collected are the openings of the individuals. And uh, they work in different cities. And the information we collected are not official statements from the different cities. So we uh, reached out to 25 cities across North America, mainly US and Canada. And uh, we uh, fortunately got 14, uh, got 11 cities, um, they responded to us. So those are the list of the 11 cities. And uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, details about uh, this uh, uh, jurisdictional scan. And I would just give you a very uh, quick overview of one of the questions. So in the end of the interview, we asked them, do you think it's feasible to have interim guidelines in a dense urban environment? And uh, you can say there's a two cities that are yes, but uh, uh, even the yes is not 100% yes, because uh, and the coordinator even said they are, not they, they are not sure if it is feasible. So even they said it's feasible, but they are still not sure. And then there's four cities said maybe conditional, depends on. And then there's five cities said no, they, they will need uh, broader uh, providers, and also probably it should go to the provincial or even federal. So that's just an example of the, the, the answers from the jurisdiction scan. And as you can see, just for this question, you are expecting maybe a clear answer. It's not very clear. Then we actually move on and we say, OK, so the, because the limitation of the survey, because the response are only based on opinion of one to two individuals per cities, and, uh, and also and uh, there's a quite a difference among the cities. Maybe we look back to our Toronto uh, uh, stakeholders. And that's why we also hold the public stakeholder workshop. We actually uh, have 29 uh, representatives. They represent disability organizations. They are city staff. They have city planning and the human rights related work. And also we have the researchers with expert, uh, um, expertise in accessibility and built environment. And then there's a four key uh, group that uh, is part of this uh, uh, stakeholder workshop. So uh, they have the uh, Canadian National Institute for the Blind and the Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit plus the Toronto Accessibility Advisor Committee, as well as Accessibility Advisor Panel for Transportation Service. And uh, it, overall, that's a very, uh, I think, uh, uh, engaging and uh, successful uh, stakeholder uh, workshop. And uh, the stakeholders, they provide the feedback about the benefits and the challenges. And I think uh, Ryan and clearly and nicely lay out some of the uh, benefits and challenges and also give the examples. And I think a lot of what Ryan said was also be uh, very clearly, uh, I think, mentioned by many stakeholders. And also, at the end of the workshop, there is no consensus among stakeholders on the feasibility of developing criteria and specifications. For the internal web. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, understandable and uh, probably expected, and uh, we are not uh, surprised that, that at the end of the workshop, uh, we didn't hear the clear answer that, uh, of course, uh, we, we would like to hear. Uh, but I think that's also uh, on one side, review how complex and challenging these issues are. And also, there's one area actually was very clear uh, that uh, many, many stakeholders repeated that uh, the importance of maintaining uh, adequate pedestrian clear way with. So, because we didn't get a, a very clear answer from the literature review and the jurisdiction scan, as well as the stakeholder uh, workshop, we are thinking, mm, 
maybe we can look at the transit access ramp because that actually indeed have standards and has a long history of use. And we look at uh, what type of uh, specifications, especially uh, the slope, uh, because uh, uh, one, one aspect we have to look at is whether it's feasible to uh, establish uh, technical uh, um, guidelines. And uh, I think one thing we noticed is that uh, uh, the slope angle actually is really important. And, uh, and the recommended slope angle is at least one to 16. And we know that uh, in the current Toronto exceptionally deadline, it should be 120 ramp. And that has implications. Sophia, just oh, wanted to say, yes. uh, if you could wrap up in the next five minutes, that would be yeah. really helpful. Thank I, you. I will, I will. So this is actually the, the last uh, few slides. And so we have recommendations and we think we can actually looking at the current placement guidelines and I list it here. And also we think the development of te technical guidelines is not feasible. And we could use existing standards and guidelines and also more research. And I think more research is definitely needed. And that's why at the moment, I also want to give you a heads up is uh, I think some of you already know that we have a, we call challenging environment accessible assessment laboratory. And we have motion base and we also have those four labs, especially the stair lab on the right uh, upper corner, we can actually test a lot of design of the ramps and that might be one way we need more research actually to inform us whether the technical uh, guideline could be established or what we can do in in the future so uh, here is uh, uh, ryan and my uh, contact information and if uh, you are interested to know uh, more and definitely i'm happy to answer Thank you so much, Ryan and Sophia. Members, do you have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Ashley. Uh, yeah, my question, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, my question is, uh, Sophia, I wondered, you talked about going to a few cities there, you got 11 responses. My, my question is, uh, uh, you're, uh, you considered perhaps uh, checking out or connecting with the United Nations, uh, looking at their sustainable goals initiatives and wondering whether or not where accessibility, first of all, fits in. I, I can't remember whether it's human rights or, or or disability equity. I can't remember the exact of which of the sustainable goals or 16 of them, but to checking with the sustainable goals of the United Nations and then to find out, for example, are there particular uh, nations uh, that have been affirmed uh, as being very progressive uh, and meeting the standards of the United Nations uh, to make everything equitable uh, and uh, inclusive and accessible. That's my question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a really, really good suggestion. And uh, I do have a colleague actually has a really good relationship with Union, uh, United Nations Accessibility uh, Group. So I definitely will follow up with her and then to see if there's uh, uh, any uh, aspect like uh, recommendations or any work on that. Um, but uh, to address also uh, part of your question is, uh, we actually did an online search and we actually uh, go beyond the North American. We did the, 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 the website search like uh, all over the world. And uh, example, uh, Japan, they are very good with accessibility. But the interim ramp, I think uh, normally they fall so for like between the cracks, because uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's temporary. And uh, normally the recommendation is when you make the building, make the entrance, it should be already accessible. So the interim ramp doesn't fall in any of the standards. That's why we couldn't really find any standard. Actually, some even mentioned it. But in Toronto, it is big. I didn't mention because we also did a stage one study and we surveyed. We have our students going out to, uh, like summer and uh, winter going out to survey some of the picture actually is from our students took the picture. We surveyed 180 kilometer of the street and we found out just for private small business, there's over 4,000 small business has step entries. On average, every 40 
four meters, you will have a step entrance. So it is a big problem. And I think we are really, I think, passionate about solving this problem, but there's also a lot of barriers. And I think it has to be a collective uh, effort in order actually to, it's not just one, one solution will fix all. I think we need to find new technologies and innovative ways actually to find a solution for this. I think it's probably Toronto has one of the bigger issues because a lot of historical building uh, we are facing this issue. Well, Sophia, just one other point. Uh, it might, I, I worked in uh, Finland for five years uh, on inclusion and so on, and it might be worth putting that on your uh, bucket list to check and see what they're doing over there in Finland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Are there any other questions on this item? Seeing none, are there any comments for this item? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thank you, Ryan and Sophia. I do have a motion and I'll ask the clerk to display it for us and I'll read it out. Technical difficulties. One second, please. There we go. Um, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that the General Manager Transportation Services report back to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in the first quarter of 2023 with an update on the development of placement guidelines for interim private storefront ramps on the public right away. Such an update is to include the following. A, a summary of the draft guidelines with a full draft document included with the item. B, a summary of the consultation process for developing the guidelines. C, a description of how the guidelines will be incorporated into the permitting process. And D, the limits of the guidelines, including situations that cannot be accommodated under the item. Are there any questions on the motion? Okay, we can take a vote then, and we will take a recorded vote on this item as there was a declared interest. I'll ask the clerk to assist. I'm all in favor. Members, when I call your name, please indicate how you are voting. I will start with Ashley Malloy. I think that was in favor, you were on mute. In favor of the motion. Thank you. Jason Mitchell. In favor of the motion. Wendy Porch. In favor. Uh, Michelle Petridis. In favor. Uh, Lana Williams. In favor. And Howard Wax. Howard, are you on the call? He might be on mute. Howard, if you can hear us um, and unmute, unmute your mic and let us know your vote on the item. Okay, we'll just put Howard as absent. And Madam Chair, your vote please. In favor. That's six in favor and none opposed. Um, just a moment please. The motion carries, Madam Chair. Very much. Uh, if we can get member Luke Anderson back, we will proceed with the next item.
Oh, Luke Anderson back. Apologies. Our next item is D121.4, Accessibility in Construction Zones. I believe Barbara Gray, General Manager, Transportation Services, and Michael D'Andrea, Chief Engineer and Executive Director, Engineering and Construction Services, are here to give this presentation. I know you have a lot to cover. Hopefully everyone has read the material, um, and I believe your presentation is 15 minutes. I am just going to use the timer to help keep us on track. Thank you very much, and thanks for having us here today. Uh, Jennifer Neese from my staff is going to be helping uh, advance the slides, and I thank you for the time today. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Barbara Gray. I'm the General Manager of Transportation, and I am joined by my colleague, Michael D'Andrea, who's the Chief Engineer and Executive Director of Engineering and Construction Services. So. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about a very important topic, and I know of critical interest to this committee is accessibility in construction zones. Uh, as you all know, there are many people involved in construction activities within the city, including transportation, ECS, and Toronto Water, as well as our partners at the TTC, private utility companies, and also, and increasingly so, private development uh, that is adjacent to the right of way. And barriers to accessibility are, are a significant concern uh, in a wide array of construction zones that involve any of these constructors. And today's focus is largely on the long-term capital projects and the building developments adjacent to the right-of-way where we see that with the huge uptick in, in construction in the city uh, are causing issues that really uh, we need to be well out ahead of. So next slide, please. This slide uh, is is titled uh, Decision History, and it ref it's related to the request for this presentation, uh, prompted by a letter from yourselves at the Accessibility Advisory Committee. The Executive Committee directed the City Manager in consultation with relevant city divisions to report to the Executive Committee and your committee on the tools and strategies that the city currently uses to ensure accessibility in the public realm surrounding private development, as well as capital projects. And the original direction was to report to those committees in May. We requested an extension to today's meeting in order to ensure that we had a comprehensive report. I did want to say, however, that we don't see this as, um, as a one and done solution. We, we understand this is an ongoing issue that has many pressing needs. And so uh, you'll see that we have a recommendation to come back in 2023 with additional updates. And we look very much forward to getting feedback and insights from, uh, from yourselves on continuous improvement of how we manage this work. So moving on to the next slide, please. The title of this slide is Regulations and Standards and, um, and Accessibility Standards for Temporary Conditions in Construction Zones are regulated at the provincial level through the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, AODA. And those standards are embedded in the Ontario Traffic Manual, specifically Book 7 for Temporary Conditions and Book 15, Pedestrian Crossing Treatments. Toronto's accessibility design guidelines address AODA, including in construction zones, and always attempt to meet or exceed provincial guidelines. And these documents are referenced in construction contracts and in street occupancy permits. And as part of preparing for this work, we went back and did a pretty thorough review to ensure that they were adequate. Uh, also, Chapter 743 governs the permitting process for construction activities in the right of way. We also have standards for designing and constructing city infrastructure that outlines the process for undertaking major capital projects, and further details on these standards are contained in the appendices to the slide presentation, which I, I won't cover today, but I believe you all have uh, as reference material. So next slide, please. The title of this slide is Constructors and City Oversight. It contains a table that identifies six categories of construction projects and the organizations responsible for each type of project, and then outlines the degree of city oversight applied for each project category. Uh, there's a wide variety of constructors who impact the public right of way, and the city has a number of divisions and agencies who undertake public works, largely through contracted services. And the scope and scale of projects also vary considerably, as you know, and the different approaches that are used to provide the City of Toronto uh, oversight of these activities are, are considerable. Um, the largest city-led projects are major capital works, uh, largely managed by Michael Shop in engineering and construction, and include capital works done 
on behalf of Transportation Services, Toronto Water, the TTC, and uh, and others as well. And these projects all include at least one on-site inspector who may be either a city staff or a consultant whose uh, job it is to oversee that construction. Um, long duration projects, of which we have many, also include transit expansion activities by Metrolinx, which will continue to be prevalent with the Ontario line construction, especially uh, as it uh, travels through the downtown over the next uh, five years. Smaller capital projects are undertaken by transportation services in Toronto water, including both planned and emergency repairs. And utilities such as Bell Canada, Toronto Hydro, and Bridge Gas have infrastructure on the public right-of-way, and they also undertake both planned and emergency construction work. And then finally, uh, building construction at the property line, so those buildings that come right up to the edge of the back of the sidewalk, require the temporary use of space on the public right-of-way. And the site protection at these developments is patrolled and spot inspected, but is uh, significant in that it often carries on for a number of years. Um, for any constructor other than city staff, a permit must be obtained from transportation services. And permit applications must include a traffic control plan that addresses both vehicular and pedestrian movement impacted by the work. These plans are reviewed by work zone coordinators prior to issuing the permit and are discussed with those coordinators prior to the start of construction. So just because a constructor gets a permit, they're not actually able to go forth and do that work unless it is emergency work without the sign off of the work zone coordinators. At this moment, we think that the larger projects are the ones that are the most critical address uh, to address today. They inherently have greater likelihood for impacts on people with disabilities because of the project duration and scale. And this impact is also exacerbated by the need for changes in the traffic management approach as the project proceeds. And this includes changes to the pedestrian routing, uh, which needs to accommodate dif different phases of the project's construction. And these changes are particularly challenging because they can impact consistency and predictability, which we know is critical for accessibility. Next slide, please. So the title of this slide is Enforcement. It's the first of two enforcement-related slides. It shows a picture of one of our Transportation Standards Officers. Uh, and as shown on the previous slide, project and contract managers at the city are responsible for overseeing all aspects of construction activity. Uh, and construction activities that are undertaken by our city staff are supervised by city staff. Uh, enforcement, which I know is a is an extremely important issue, uh, is conducted by transportation standards officers in transportation, and it's focused on activities by third parties, such as contractors and utilities. These standards officers will conduct inspections and respond to complaints that originate from 311 submissions from other city staff, such as our maintenance patrollers who are out on the street, council offices, and when time permits, these standards officers will also conduct, patro conduct patrols. Uh, enforcement by our standards officers is focused on the safety and condition of the right-of-way to ensure that passers-by are not in danger and their path is unencumbered. Uh, TSOs, as we call them, will also inspect the site for compliance with permits and plans and ensure that no unpermitted activity, such as blockages or encroachments, are being undertaken. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that I would say about our transportation standards officers is their role is significant and we don't necessarily have enough of them to cover all of the construction activities that are occurring in the right-of-way to be everywhere that they need to be. Uh, so that's an important uh, distinction that I think uh, will be something we recommend in future. So moving on to the next slide, please. This is the second of two enforcement related slides. Enforcement by our standards officer starts with educating constructors on how to achieve compliance when issues are identified on site. Uh, and this would be considered a verbal warning. The next step is an official notice of violation with a series of levels for escalation. And there's some discretion in escalating the enforcement process to a notice of violation based on the nature of the infractions and the responsiveness of the constructor. An escalation can include a summons, standard fines, uh, potential escalation of financial penalties, and even jail time through court-based escalation. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. So this is an example of a capital project that's um, being delivered by Engineering and Construction Services. So they 
as I mentioned, deliver construction of municipal infrastructure, often roads, sidewalks, sewer, and water main work in the public right-of-way. And to facilitate this construction, it may be necessary to temporarily divert pedestrian, cycling, and vehicular traffic within the construction zone. The image in this slide is a picture of the project on Front Street looking east to the church intersection. It includes the reconstruction of the sidewalk, so a road lane has been designated as the alternate path for pedestrians. Temporary construction fencing is used to separate pedestrians from the work area, and an asphalt ramp was constructed to provide safe and smooth transition from the curb to the road level. A sign is posted indicating that the sidewalk is closed. Orange and black striped traffic control barrels separate vehicular traffic from the pedestrian at the road level. Uh, ECS contracts uh, include the provisions that require their contractors who do the work on their behalf to also ensure the safety of the public with a focus on pedestrians and cyclists, including following the access applicable AODA provisions. So prior to starting construction, the contractor must submit a traffic control plan to identify how pedestrian and vehic vehicular movement will be accommodated. This control plan is reviewed and accepted by both engineering construction services and transportation and a pre-construction meeting with the contractor is mandatory. So since each location has its own challenges based on existing conditions and the scope of the construction, this control plan is project specific and may even be updated throughout the project in different phases as the project occupies different areas of the right of way. And ECS has inspectors on site, as I mentioned, either their own staff or contracted to inspect the work, which includes checking that the control plan has been properly implemented and maintained. Uh, they would document and discuss any problems with the contractor to ensure appropriate remediation action is taken, and if problems remain, the matter will be escalated to ECS project manager to conduct management from the contractor. Next slide, please. This slide is uh, titled adjacent, Example of Adjacent Construction, and the image on this slide is of a street corner where a tower development is in progress, so this is uh, private development. The gray construction hoarding separates the development site from the pedestrian area, and the curb lane has be been reallocated for pedestrian movement. On the approach to the corner from both directions, the pedestrian path is separated from vehicular traffic by a concrete jersey barrier, and at the corner itself, the need for gate access to the site for vehicles prevents the use of stationary barriers. So the orange and black striped plastic traffic barrels are placed to separate the vehicle space from the pedestrian space. And moving from the right-hand side of the image, pedestrians are traveling at the road level and then use a temporary asphalt ramp to shift to sidewalk level when they reach the corner. After turning the corner, another temporary asphalt ramp connects to road level to continue in the next protected area in the relocated curb lane. The hoarding of the site extends to the ground, providing a tactile surface along with the which a pedestrian uh, using a white cane can navigate. However, there are areas such as the driveway, which is enclosed by gates stopping several inches above the ground where the tapping capability is not provided. On the left side of the image, you can see some of the orange and black striped traffic barrels were removed from the road to enable vehicle access via the second gate that may not have been replaced thoroughly to prevent pedestrians from drifting into the motor vehicle space. And there is no traffic control person in place directing traffic in their absence, which leads us to believe this was not just a moment in time during the use of that gate. Also, the barrels may not be appropriately spaced to prevent inadvertently shifting into the road. It's also unclear if the width of the retained sidewalk going around the corner is sufficiently wide to provide access for a pedestrian with a mobility device. It is certainly not wide enough to allow two people to pass one another. So these are the types of on-site conditions that we see uh, with some consistency and transportation overseas permitting for this work by third parties in the public right-of-way or when adjacent construction needs to occupy the public space temporarily. Uh, in this case, the street occupation permit requires that people submit a detailed site plan, a proposal of their request, how the right-of-way is to be used, the duration of the occupation, the proposed work schedule, the traffic control plan that follows AODA and other standards previously described that describes how pedestrians and vehicles will be accommodated, including safe, accessible, and well-marked routes, uh, including those who use mobility devices, have vision impairment or other disabilities, and how traffic control is implemented will depend in part on the location of the project uh, and the number of phases of the project. If it's a multi-phase project, it may have a traffic control plan in place for each phase, and the potential changes increase the need for good design and implementation and also clear wayfinding. So our City of Toronto work zone coordinators, they would meet in advance with the developer to review these traffic control plans and ensure that all accessibility provisions are in place prior to the beginning of the work. 
And then the standards officers will visit the work site intermittently to inspect if the traffic control plan has been adhered to. And they would document and discuss problems identified, including safety hazards and accessibility barriers, and then would return later to confirm the changes that have been made. And uh, as I described earlier, if problems remain, there's an escalation process uh, that could be applied. So moving on to the next slide, this slide is called Improvements in Progress. Uh, a number of improvements for preserving accessibility are already in progress, and these include updated standards in the OTM Book 7 that was completed in just April of this year, and accessibility design guidelines that were updated in 2021. A review of TS 1.00 is planned. That's the city's own construction specifications for maintenance of traffic. Uh, we are also proposing staff training on regulations and standards become more frequent, so it's periodic now, but uh, there are future opportunities planned that include a focus on accessibility. And the terms and conditions recorded on permits will also include improved references to requirements to increase the importance of accessibility with permit holders. Uh, we are also, we have launched uh, a construction hub program that's been established for areas with multiple projects, both public and private, development in close proximity. This, the scope of this program, it started up at Young and Eglinton uh, a couple of years ago when the construction up there became quite significant. And the goal is to provide extra attention, coordination, communication, and enforcement through the role of a senior program manager who would be uh, overseeing that entire construction hub. And there's, as I mentioned, the first hub at Young and Eglinton. There are new hubs that have just been established in the downtown. Uh, if you uh, look at a map, they, they effectively track the, the track of the Ontario line, but also in locations with lots of private development like Liberty Village, the downtown, East Harbor, and the West Onlands. Next slide, please. Uh, we have generated, the, the title of this slide is, is improvements uh, proposed as well, and we've generated ideas for further improvements with our team with new processes, education and enforcement, uh, tracking of complaints for training and continuous improvement, integrating enhanced requirements into tendering documents and procurement processes so they are upfront and clear early on with our contractors. Uh, on the education front, development of case studies highlighting good and best practices outreach to and potential collaboration with industry and trade associations, developing more detailed guiding checklists to outline the barriers to be considered for a range of disabilities, development of experiential training for staff to heighten sensitivities to barriers, particularly less obvious disabilities, and then uh, enforcement as well. So while we always seek compliance, enforcement is a critical piece of this and establishing uh, additional dedicated enforcement staff with really deep knowledge and training on accessibility uh, and consider requiring submission of third-party site audits as a condition of permits. Um, so we also are interested in doing um, broader community surveys to obtain feedback from people with disabilities about their experience, uh, additional consultation, um, and then any modifications that might need to happen to the municipal code as a result of that would be uh, would be moved along as well. Uh, certainly, we're this is a, a relatively significant work program in terms of not only its impact but its scope and its size, and so we'll need to prioritize as we move forward. And would welcome comments from the advisory uh, accessibility committee on on what you think is the most important thing to do first, and then uh, we also want to make sure that we are raising awareness about any updates amongst all of our stakeholders. Um, and so with that, uh, I think I am wrapped up. Here's our contact information for Michael and I. I'm sure you'll have questions and comments, so um, we're happy to take those. And we have other members of our team here uh, if, uh, if Michael and I can't answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barbara. Are there any questions on the presentation? Ashley. You're on mute still, Ashley. Whether or not there's a requirement and what are the what are the rules or what are the obligations when there may or may not be uh, need of a uh, police officer there to uh, be present uh, in terms of uh, directing traffic or watching traffic is, is that like if it's a private developer or a city uh, construction site, can you tell me how that works, the, the uh, 
the presence of a police officer to uh, direct traffic? Like, what is the what are the rules about that? That's a great question. I'm going to start, and um, others might jump in with a little bit more detail. I have Craig Cripps and um, Eric Jensen here from my Works on Coordination team. Um, in in many locations, the presence of an on-site either paid duty officer, it's typically a paid duty officer and not a, a, an on-duty officer. Uh, one of our traffic agents or other traffic management personnel is critical to be able to help people navigate through the work zone. And um, and the requirements are based on the site conditions at, at that location, uh, and then also the availability of those resources. So Craig, I, I know that the um, the number of paid duty officers that exist in, in the city is a, is a surprisingly small number. They are uh, in very high demand, not only for construction activities, but also uh, for special events as well. And so um, there are certain situations where in order to proceed with the construction, uh, we have to have that kind of paid duty on site. Uh, we are trying to get more of that resource. We've recently created a traffic agent program in transportation services to help support uh, construction and, and throughput at very um, difficult and high, heavily traveled and uh, organizations uh, or locations rather. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has anything to add about uh, the requirements, which I think was the key point of the question. Yeah, if I may, Barbara, just provide a little bit more additional information on that as far as private development and construction staging areas, any occupations of the public right of way for private development, if it's in excess of 30 days, requires a report to council in the, either community council or full council. In that report, there is wording that my team, the work zone coordination team, along with Toronto Police Services construction liaison officer, has the ability to put that requirement of a pay due the officer on site to assist construction activities and that's based on the level of activities on the site so if for example there's a very high truck volume day for concrete pours or excavations we can insist that the developer provides a pay duty officer to provide that extra level of control and safety for other road users in those staging areas as a bare minimum there is a requirement that the uh, developer provides a traffic control person at their act access and egress gates to the site to provide that type of control of construction vehicles that may be encumbered from accessing and egressing the site to provide that additional level of control for pedestrians that might be in a temporary corridor and make sure there's no conflict between those construction vehicles and other vulnerable road users. Thank you, Craig. That sounds very comprehensive. Thank you very, very much. I understand now and uh, feel much more uh, at ease that that is being addressed. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I, I would just say, Ashley, that um, the the thing that we struggle with, I think, quite mightily, is the um, the amount of both paid duty officers and and traffic agents, the the actual boots on the ground personnel, mm -hmm. to be able to manage, especially given how much construction activity we have in the city. So uh, that that's our ongoing challenge: is to try to get as uh, adequate resource to be able to be on the ground in those situations. Well, just further, Barb, you know, I, I noticed that sometimes there's just one of the construction guys themselves with a sign, you know, slow down or go, stop, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm sure they're not trained other than just common sense to kind of watch the flow of traffic going one way and then going the other way. You know, when there's <clears throat> only one lane and they stop one one flow of traffic. And so how, how are they decided? Just just ad, ad lib by the construction company themselves? Um, if I can... Sorry, whoever, whoever wants to answer that would be appreciated. Yeah, through the chair, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it. Um, just as uh, as Barbara noted, I mean, when we do ask for PDOs, particularly when we're close to an intersection, it's a requirement within our contracts. Admittedly, as Barbara noted, uh, getting access to a PDO has been challenged over the last number of years. There aren't enough of them to go around. I think if you can appreciate Barbara's earlier comments, there's the amount of construction taking place across the city. It's one of the reasons, and then there's competing demands on PDOs. So, uh, you know, the contractor has no choice but to, you know, to assign one of their staff uh, with some training uh, to act as a as a traffic control, uh, you know, with a flag and uh, and uh, signage. But uh, it's not, not ideal, but in the, in the absence of having a dedicated PDO, they have no choice. Okay, I understand now. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Ashley. Wendy, I believe I saw your hand for questions. Yes, thank you very much. I found the presentation very helpful in terms of understanding, I think, some of the pressures that are, um, you know, impinging on, on the ability to provide these kinds of environments in a safe way. Um, years ago, we, we did hear, uh, this is my last TAC meeting, by the way, just wanted to put that out there. I mean, years ago, when I was on the TAC early on, the um, we heard a presentation on this very topic. And uh, my question at the time was, if a person with a disability comes across comes upon a construction site and is unclear, you know, where they're supposed to go safely, how they're supposed to navigate it, what are they supposed to do at that point? And I guess I'm still asking the question. So at the time we had been given the advice that, you know, the individual needs to wave down somebody in a certain colored vest and ask them for some assistance. Uh, that is obviously difficult for somebody who has a visual disability or somebody who can't use their hands or you know any number of folks with disabilities so i guess i want to revisit the question first of all secondly i know that you've talked a little bit about complaints and so i guess i'd like to ask to whom should a complaint be directed in this context as well um and then thirdly i have three questions uh you've been talking a little bit about on-site consultations and whether or not uh, a site audit should be part of the general process of getting a permit. And if you were to re revisit that and tell us a little bit more about it, what would be the next steps for actually implementing that as part of the process for uh, providing permits? So three questions for me, what is the practical advice for folks on site if they come across something in situ? Uh, two, to whom does the complaint get directed? And then three, a little bit more information about the, the possibility of on-site audits. Thank you, Wendy. Those are excellent questions. I'm going to take them out of order just to just to be uh, the one that's the easiest first, and then I'll let my colleagues think about the answers to the other ones. <clears throat> the first one for me is the second one on who to direct complaints to, which I think now, um, I mean, this is assuming that people have access uh, to a handheld uh, phone, which is not everybody's situation, but for those people who do, the new 311 app that allows you to take a picture and register a complaint uh, is, is excellent and actually comes to us directly. So Gary York at 311 has been um, doing a, a, a bit of work to try to make that a more straightforward tool for people in the, in the ground on the ground to be able to record and get information to the right people. So um, we do look at those and uh, and uh, we do uh, encourage people because as we've described, the dynamic nature of construction is such that it might work just fine on Monday, but things shift around on Tuesday and we need to be able to direct our standards officers to go back out to the site. Uh, so having that information from on the ground users is extremely helpful. Uh, and um, I think on the, on the audit one, um, I know that we haven't always had uh, perhaps as much diligence on the pre-construction uh, meetings as we do now, because they're really a critical tool to ensure that the constructor understands the requirements and the impacts but around a number of different issues, but also around accessibility. Um, but I do think that the more that we can get our own staff uh, out in the field to think about uh, the construction sites through the eyes of somebody who's trying to navigate it with uh, various disabilities um, is, is a critical piece of that audit process is that we have our own folks out there doing those audits. Um, and I'll let other people uh, weigh in now on, uh, on, on your first question and uh, probably a little bit more on the construction audit. Through the chair, uh, uh, Barbara, Wendy, uh, I'll comment in terms of the who do you contact on the uh, in respect to the projects, just a, a, a point of additional information. So with on projects that are managed by my division, Engineering and Construction Services, the signage uh, does identify a contract number. And that contract number, the coding on the contract number, actually identifies the particular group down to the manager level in terms of overseeing the contract. So as Barbara noted, a picture of the site with the contract number over 311 gets the complaint directly to the individuals that are overseeing that particular project. So it's sort of a fast tracking of making contact with the individuals. Uh, further to that, in terms of, of uh, some of our, our construction projects, particularly in the downtown core, uh, we do have, um, uh, so our inspectors are there full time. 
But in some cases, we also have what are called field ambassadors, and they they are there to help out the businesses and the pedestrians uh, in any manner that they can, and to forewarn them in terms of of what's forthcoming. As well, as Barbara noted, one of the things that we are really focusing on is making sure that you know we have signage well ahead of the actual work zone, so that you know if there's a redirection of rerouting of, of pedestrians, that they are notified well ahead of time, and then as well. Our construction notices uh, make every effort of, of identifying what the impacts to to the public are, and that's pedestrians as well as vehicle traffic, as in respect to a redirection of uh, of traffic and pedestrian flow across the work zone. And just uh, go ahead. Chris. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, through the speaker, just one additional uh, comment as far as the temporary pedestrian corridors is we're looking at uh, we're looking at a few steps to try to provide a little additional positive guidance for pedestrians and uh, vulnerable road users through the temporary relocation of the sidewalk. Um, it's certainly tightening up of traffic control devices um, and also looking at using blaze orange colors around entryways into uh, into covered walkways that are a little more noticeable and provide that additional level of positive guidance. Certainly, if there are areas where we can divert pedestrians without having them go through a temporary corridor and divert them to the other side of the street in a controlled crossing, um, we also do consider that depending on pedestrian volumes and road users in that in that area. Thank you. So, Wendy, did we get them all? Um. Thank you for asking. I'm I'm still just wondering about the individual with a disability who comes up to an unexpected construction site and is trying to work out how to get through the site. So, um, you know, I guess maybe not. Maybe haven't answered all my questions yet. <laughs> I think I have a much clearer sense of where to go in terms of a complaint. And certainly that information around 311 is very helpful and for folks who can take a picture of something and get the numbers uh, and knowing that that goes directly to you is very helpful. But in, in situ, I, I guess our, our folks still just looking for somebody with a vest on that looks like they're associated with the construction to ask for help. Is there, you know, because this is actually what happens, right? I think that the notices right. that go out are great for people who live in the area or, you know, for, for permanent residents there. But if you're just a person with a disability and you're trying to get somewhere downtown, you might not have received forewarning of this. And so you're gonna come up against something and try to negotiate it in real time. And so I'm still just looking for something clear around that. To the chair, and and I think that's um that's a really important point, and I don't think we have a consistent answer for it, right? I think that um, probably the best advice is to look for somebody who is associated or affiliated with that construction zone. They are going to be wearing reflective uh, material vests or hard hat, or um, they probably and I and we will take this back as I mentioned. We're not um, kind of here we are and and this is perfect and we're moving on we have we have a lot of work to do and i think it's important to to recognize that that on the ground contact is critical for people who as you mentioned they're not in the neighborhood this is not something they've received a notice about they're just out doing a daily task and they come across a construction site and need some help navigating um, i would feel better if we if i felt like we had the amount of on-duty personnel that were actually required given the amount of changeability of a construction zone um, but we're moving in that direction and um and so we'll definitely take that back and 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 see what we can do with that because i think it's an important an important point thank you barbara any other questions on this item oh apologies Yes, Michelle. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Barbara and team for your presentation. It was very detailed. Uh, I meant to also thank our previous presenters, but they were doing fire alarm testing this morning. So my apologies. Uh, but I have a question about something that stood out around the education piece. And it was specifically the development of experiential training for staff to heighten sensitivities to barriers. And I'm Wondering if you can speak a little bit more to what you mean by experiential training. Sure, uh, through the chair. Thank you, Michelle, for that question. So you all know I'm from the from the, the West Coast originally, and um, uh, many years ago now did a 
pedestrian uh, master plan for the city of Seattle, where we were heavily focused on accessibility um, and and mobility, but but especially in construction zones. And what we found was that there nothing really replaced um, a trainer taking personnel through uh, a, a, an area that was challenging to navigate, simulating a disability. Nothing really changed it. Uh, I mean, nothing was quite as impactful in terms of expressing to traffic engineers the concern and frustration around trying to navigate a busy intersection um, or trying to navigate a construction zone with low visibility and what it actually uh, might be perceived at and what you could what you could uh, more easily navigate and just how to how to set that up. So we would like to embark on that. Um, we would welcome thoughts about how to take that on. But um, but that that is a uh, I think is a was we really saw a change in transition in the mindset of the people who oversaw uh, those construction zones who um, delivered that those services when they were uh, on the ground and doing that kind of experiential training. So that's what's meant by that. Um, uh, there was a network of people out out west who were um, able to do that kind of training, and and we have to dig in a little bit to try to find that expertise here. But we'll we'll find it. Thank you. I'll have some comments for that, but I'll save that for the comments. So I appreciate your answer. Thanks, Barbara. Okay. And Michelle, I just wanted to say uh, just a thank you to Ryan Lanyon, who was the previous presenter, who's also um, you're very well familiar with and quite sensitized to the issues that this committee uh, is is focused on and has been very instrumental in helping us uh, along with Jennifer Nissan on his team and pulling this all together. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, another call for questions? Seeing then, I will go to comments. Uh, Michelle, I heard you say you had some, so why don't we start with you? Yes, so thank you for, it's related to the question I just had, so thank you for your answer. Um, respectfully, I would just strongly recommend that any kind of experiential training around the experience of being disabled and navigating public spaces be led by people with disabilities. Um, there is a really big difference between say wearing a blindfold or living with a low vision or blindness uh, with being a wheelchair user or just you know trying to navigate in a wheelchair for 10 minutes. So I just really want to say I, I can understand where that kind of training would have helpful outcomes. But if you can have people with disabilities leading that, that would be, I think, far more impactful um, than any kind of sort of simulation. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Wendy. Thank you, Michelle, too. I wanted to just kind of piggyback on your uh, comments around disability simulation training. So um, I think that there is actually a growing body of uh, research that suggests that the training uh, tends disability simulation training. So people in a wheelchair, you know, somebody without a disability, pretending to have a disability for a day or goggles or, you know, uh, earplugs, that actually it, it tends to um, uh, promote stereotypes around uh, what the lived experiences of people with disabilities. So it's, um, it's something that doesn't really happen very often anymore. I think that there was a real time when that was kind of a a mainstream way of thinking about raising awareness about the lived experience of people with disabilities. It's, it's no longer really seen as something that um, is that helpful, particularly just in terms of, you know, people having a very small uh, sort of out of context experience and drawing huge conclusions of what that means. And so just to say, I agree with Michelle that if you're going to have, and I think it's a great idea to have this, in fact, training with uh, the intention of illuminating what some of the accessibility barriers are, and there are many of them at the moment. As, as you said, Barbara, the construction in the city of Toronto is, um, you know, we've never seen anything quite like this, the amount of construction sites. And so the impact on our community is daily. Uh, and so I think that the training to think about, you know, how does this impact people with disabilities is critical, and it's a critical part of solving the problem, particularly if you're understaffed, which is what I heard you say quite clearly. Uh, but I think it should be something that um, disabled people have input on and or lead. 
so that the context of the of the training um, does not reinforce these kinds of stereotypes about what it means to be a person who is blind or a person with limited mobility. So, um, and also just uh, as a secondary comment, the I really appreciate how frank you have all been around the kinds of concerns and uh, limitations, I think, that that you have in terms of responding to these sorts of accessibility concerns. Um, I do think that a very consistent answer to the question of what do you do when you come up to a construction site? Who are you supposed to look for? How are you supposed to get around it? Would be a huge step forward in terms of you know supporting the accessibility of people with disabilities around construction sites in the city. And I I, I won't be on the tack any longer, but I'm still going to be with SILT. And you know this is one of the issues that we hear about. So I would very much I'm very much looking forward to something that is a consistent answer to that question that we could then uh, help to disseminate out to community members so that there is a clear sense of what do you do when you come up against one of these sort of magical mystery tours of uh, diversions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wendy. Any other comments? Seeing none, I do have a motion. Oh. oh. I'd like to speak if I'm on there. You are. I apologize, Hello? Ashley. I did not. Uh... No, no, no problem. I'd just be brief. Uh, in support of Michelle and Wendy, uh, I think that, you know, having somebody uh, who's going to do the training, obviously, we're looking for authenticity. Uh, we're looking for validity. And uh, so having, uh, you know, a person who actually is living with the particular uh, disability, it's genuine. It's believable, obviously, and it has more accuracy and, and truth to it. And uh, so we do two things. I think we, we let the general public know that this is the real deal, if I can use that expression, uh, authentic, authenticity. And second of all, uh, as both Michelle and Wendy said, we're, we're pointing out uh, that this is the true voice of the, of the disability uh, community. And I think that that really is very important in terms of uh, promoting the accurate image and that we are letting the voice of the people living with a disability speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, as I started saying, I do have a motion and I asked the clerk to display it and I will read it out. The Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that one, the general manager, transportation services, and chief engineer and executive director, engineering and construction services, report to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in the third quarter of 2023 with a progress update on preserving accessibility in construction zones, including the following. A, a detailed summary of consultation activities undertaken and feedback received from individuals and organizations in the accessibility community regarding barriers posed by construction zones on city sidewalks. B, a detailed summary of outreach and education activities undertaken and planned for later in 2023 with the construction industry regarding the preservation of accessibility in construction zones. C, the results of the review of the city standards for designing and constructing city infrastructure, specifically the TS1.00 construction specifications for maintenance of traffic, and D, the status of implementing the proposed improvements as outlined in the presentation from city staff to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee on June 13th. Does anyone have any questions about the motion? Seeing none, uh, just a reminder to all uh, committee members, if you can put your cameras on, um, and I will ask, uh, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing none, that carries. Our next item is D121.5, Our Play in Toronto, a jurisdictional review and draft official plan, vision statement and principles for accessibility feedback. Today we have Jeffrey Cantos, Paul Solish, and Rafael Meja Ortiz from City Planning here to give the presentation. 
Again, I believe your presentation is 10 minutes, and I will use the timer just to help keep us on track um, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of committee. I uh, will try to be a bit less than 10 minutes. Um, again, my name is, oh, sorry, we're going to share our screen. Great. Um, my name is Jeff Cantos, the manager of the city's official plan team, and I'll, we'll go to the next slide, please. So the purpose of this presentation is to respond to the Plano Accessibility and Advisory Committee's motion um, from back in November 2021, recommending that the Chief Planner, number one, conduct a cross-jurisdictional review of policies that includes an equity-deserving lens that incorporates the needs of people with disabilities into long-term land use plans, and number two, prepare draft policies as part of the Municipal Comprehensive Review, which incorporate an equity-deserving lens with a focus on the needs of people living with disabilities. Um, next slide, please. So our study process. First, we received uh, the committee's direction uh, back in November. And from there, uh, members of my team conducted the uh, jurisdictional scan of commonly used definitions and policies for uh, a host of, uh, for a couple cities. Number three, uh, my team hosted a accessibility focused meeting with communities who identify with disabilities, including neurologically diverse communities. And that was uh, back in February of this year, February 24th. And members of my team from there reflected on the findings from public input. And here we are today presenting a draft official plan language to Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to one of my colleagues to present about the cities that we looked at and some very, very brief findings. Okay, New York. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, so in New York, um, the accessibility context there, uh, the certain populations face housing challenges, including physical accessibility issues, affordability, language barriers, and qualification requirements. A large portion of the housing stock creates significant hardship for individuals with mobility impairments. And accessible units are also important for seniors looking to age in place and even families with small children. Next slide, please. And so New York City has a Where We Live NYC plan, and that plan ex uh, expands existing programs that assist seniors and people living with disabilities in obtaining physical modifications uh, to their units. It also improves education for architects and developers on their legal responsibilities when designing residential buildings uh, to meet accessibility requirements. It also expands el eligibility for a zoning bonus for transit accessibility improvements within high density areas. Um, and another finding we found was that it also helps to the, the We Live NYC plan uh, seeks to rehabilitate or construct all required uh, or, or construct all required pedestrian ramps. And we'll move over to Seattle. Um, so the Se Seattle has an equi equitable development implementation plan. And here we found that uh, they can in the plan, they consider future zoning amendments and their potential impacts that may increase the displacement of residents, especially marginalized populations. Uh, the plan also evaluates taxes, regulations, incentives, and other government po policies and investments to determine the benefits and burdens on marginalized populations. Um, and two more cities to go. Um, we also looked at Ottawa. Cole, will you take this one? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. So in part of our jurisdictional scan, we looked at Ottawa, Ontario, and we looked at the City of Ottawa official plan, which looks at accessibility design standards to optimize accessibility for new construction or redevelopment of existing facilities owned, leased, or operated by the city to address the needs of diverse users and some of the policy language excerpts we found from the City of Ottawa official plan include development shall demonstrate universal accessibility, plans and policies shall ensure that communities and places are designed to consider a diversity of experiences including children, older adults, people with disabilities, women and gender diverse persons, those identifying as 2SLGBTQQIA+, and people living with lower incomes. We as well looked at the City of London, Ontario in our jurisdictional scan, and we looked at their the London plan. And in it, we found that facility accessibility design standards is a mandatory design aid for new facilities, as well as the retrofit, alteration, or addition to existing facilities owned, leased, or operated by the city. 
policy language excerpts that we had found in the London in the London plan include design complete neighborhoods by meeting the needs of people of all ages, incomes, and abilities, allowing for aging in place and accessibility to amenities, facilities, and services, as well as built form that is supportive of all types of activity, mobility, and universal accessibility. And then I'll hand it back to Jeff. Great. So as I mentioned, we hosted a focused stakeholder meeting on February 24th, 2022. And some of the main key themes that we heard at that meeting were uh, centered around housing challenges and the chronic need for accessible, affordable, and support and supportive housing. In particular, individuals with intellectual disabilities who are often left out of disability and inclus inclusivity conversations, which can lead to institutionalized living and little individual choice. We also uh, heard there was themes uh, about mobility within complete communities and the universal accessibility in, in Toronto's uh, case must consider Toronto's weather. Um, we heard loud and clear that this past winter snow snowfall um, underscores the need to plan for individuals living independent, spontaneous and safe lives. And we've posted um, the presentation on our project website. So just a couple more slides. Um, the draft official plan vision statement that we have, um, and I'll just uh, share some excerpts, um, that the official plan should seek to eliminate disparities experienced by Torontonians. The official plan should prioritize climate change action and sustainability towards net zero by 2040. And the official plan should be the roadmap for Toronto to become the most inclusive city in the world. And I'll take you through some of these really quickly. The fr uh, Sorry, and how we get there. Um, how we realize this vision for 2051, we apply these draft principles for a successful and inclusive city. The first one being, the first principle being access. And some excerpts to that is that a successful city building requires improving access to many facets of daily life. So some of our excerpts from the draft, this means planning for universal accessibility for Torontonians of all ages and abilities, and, it, and, it, and enabling access to affordable housing and complete communities with parks, open spaces, and nature. The second principle on the next slide, please, for a successful and inclusive city is equity. And successful city building requires applying an equity lens that identifies and removes barriers for the city's most marginalized and vulnerable communities for achieving transformative growth and inclusive growth. So this means Means addressing present challenges faced by Torontonians and businesses without compromising the needs of future generations and economic opportunities. It means identifying policies and practices that eliminate systemic exclusion and displacement of marginalized and racialized populations, including women and the LGBTQ2S plus community. Um, finally, the third principle is about it centers around inclusion so success successful city building requires creating a safe and inclusive city for all torontonians and those yet to arrive and this means removing um, physical barriers for individuals to lead independent and spontaneous lives providing dignified and supportive housing for vulnerable populations and providing virtual and in-person engagement opportunities for all and for my last slide I'll quickly go through the, our next steps. So we're going to continue our engagement program uh, between September to December, uh, so the fall this year and the winter. Um, we will refine our draft official plan language. I've presented some excerpts uh, to you. Uh, we will write a final report with recommended chapter one of the official plan for council approval in early 2023, and we will continue to update our website. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, me and members of my team are happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Go ahead, Wendy. Hi there. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question. So um, I think it's brilliant that you've done consultations and that, that you are, you've heard from the community the range of concerns that people have around um, the need for, in particular, I think, more accessible housing, uh, but accessible spaces in general. And so I wanted to ask specifically, uh, you've given some examples of, you know, some principles, I think, that that are in the document. Uh, how have they changed based on the consultations that you had? So is that what you were describing to us, is that these have been adjusted? Because it's unclear for me uh, based on your presentation, I can't see how you have changed the original language. So could you maybe clarify that a little bit? And 
My second point related to principle two, and I think, you know, you, you, principle two speaks directly to marginalized populations. And I just wonder if it wouldn't also be helpful based on um, what you heard in the context of your consultations to include people with disabilities specifically in the language of principle two. So maybe if you could just give me a little bit more information about, you know, I realize that you're going to continue to refine these, but were they refined based on your consultations and how? Uh, and if there's any openness to adjusting principle two. Sure. And thank you for the question. And through the chair. So um, what we're reviewing is the official plan that's in place today. So they that currently there's a chapter one. And in doing so, the engagement that we uh, we we held was for the principles of how the new chapter one should be be written. Um, so we kind of just made it carte blanche, make sure that we got you know all the necessary ingredients from all the stakeholders that we met, including including communities of neurodiverse uh, communities. And the, what I presented to you are the 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 results of the engagement. So now it's now we're at the phase where we can refine. So to answer your second question, yes, we are open to um, changing and modifying uh, any of the principles as as we hear. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments on the item? Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, thank you. Just related to my question, of course, I, I'm, I would really suggest that if there is opportunity to include people with disabilities when you are uh, speaking about marginalized populations in the context of this plan that you do so specifically. I think one of the things that we've seen over the years here at the TAC and certainly in my work is that if people with disabilities are not expressly noted um, and called out, is that the community tends to be left out of conceptualizations of who we're talking about when we talk about marginalized communities and when we talk about equity deserving communities. So um, in particular, it just struck me that uh, I think the text that you had put on there from principle two was a, a natural place where you could name people with disabilities. But uh, I would suggest that if there are, are other opportunities, obviously, as you go, that you take the take the opportunity to call out and you know expressly include people with disabilities or disabled people in the context of the language that you use, because I think that um, you know, we're, we are seeing an increased understanding, I think, of the significant barriers to being a part of the city of Toronto uh, that disabled people experience. And if what we're envisioning here is the future, it would be great to see our community actually specifically mentioned in the context of this plan, because otherwise we tend to perpetuate the same cycle. So uh, I do appreciate that you've undertaken this work. I think that's great. I think it's fantastic that you've heard it from the community itself and you know moving forward that you're you're taking a spirit of making sure that our communities are represented there because no matter what disability doesn't go away we've been here from the beginning of time we will continue to be here but we need to show up more in official kinds of documents like this so i, I very much appreciate the work. thank you thank you wendy any other comments Seeing none, may I ask someone to move that the item be received for information? Thank you, Howard. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, carried. And our final agenda item is D1 21.6, Ontario Disability Related Data and COVID-19. For the presentation, ICES adjunct scientists, Hillary Brown, Yona Lunsky, and Leslie Plumpt are here. I believe your presentation requires 20 minutes. Um, and again, I'll just use the timer to help keep us on track uh, whenever you're ready. Wonderful. Thanks very much uh, for having us this morning. My name is Hilary Brown. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and an adjunct scientist at ICES, and I'll be presenting today along with Leslie and Yona. Uh, next slide, please. Leslie. 
So this is an outline of our presentation today. We'll keep our comments brief and try to leave lots of time for questions. We'll focus our remarks on where to find existing data on disability and COVID-19 related outcomes, as well as vaccination uptake, and how to request data in order to answer new questions through the Applied Health Research Question Program at ICES. Next slide. So first regarding COVID-19 outcomes. Next slide, please. Thank you. As many of you probably know, research internationally has shown that while two in 10 people have a disability, six in 10 COVID deaths have been among people with disabilities globally. And these statistics really underscore the importance of having data on disability and COVID in order to inform program and policy planning. There are several sources of data available locally to try to understand the outcomes of COVID patients with disabilities. Next slide. So first, there are health administrative data, and we'll talk uh, quite a bit about this in relation to both outcomes as well as vaccination uptake. So for example, Yona Lunsky and her team have used data from ICES to examine hospitalization and mortality rates in adults with developmental disabilities in Ontario. This is an infographic on our slide showing how much higher these rates of outcomes have been in those with intellectual and developmental disabilities broadly as well as among people with Down syndrome specifically. And the specific findings for this study are available in the link on the slide. Next slide, please. Another source of information for the Greater Toronto Area is hospital clinical data. So for example, our team has also used data from a network of hospitals in the Greater Toronto Area called Gemini to examine clinical outcomes of hospitalized COVID patients with and without disabilities. And there's a figure on this slide here showing longer length of hospital stay in patients with disabilities overall, as well as in both groups younger than 65 years of age and older than 65 years of age compared to those without disabilities. Next slide. And similarly, on this slide is a figure showing the higher rates of hospital readmission in COVID patients with disabilities overall, as well as in both younger and older age groups compared to those without disabilities. And these findings are available in the link included on the slide as well. Next slide, please. And third, uh, there are survey and interview data that are available as well. So for example, our team has partnered with the Disabled Women's Network of Canada to do a survey and interviews asking people with disabilities about the broader impacts of the COVID pandemic on their health and healthcare, especially in the area of reproductive health. And we've included information on this slide about where to find uh, more information about the study. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie, who will talk more about where to find information on vaccination uptake in people with disabilities in the greater Toronto area. Thank you, Hilary. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is Leslie Plumtree. I'm a staff scientist at ICES in the Data and Analytics Services Department. This is an external facing branch of ICES and it allows for external stakeholders to access and learn from the data that's housed at ICES. So for those who are unfamiliar with our organization, ICES is a not-for-profit research institute. We're funded by the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Long-Term Care. Uh, under Ontario's health information privacy law, ICES is allowed to collect and analyze health care data and demographic data to improve Ontario's health systems. So ICES houses a, a secure array of Ontario's health-related data. And with the onset of the pandemic, ICES began receiving COVID-related data in spring 2020, such as testing and COVID-positive case data. And then once vaccinations were being distributed in winter of 2020, this data also began to flow to ICES for reporting. So research teams at ICES have been working with public health stakeholders across Ontario to distribute COVID-19 related data to relevant organizations. There have been requests from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, uh, the Vaccine Task Force, public health units, including Toronto Public Health, um, as many as uh, many others. And here is an example of the Ontario Science Table. 
In May of 2021, a science brief from the Ontario COVID-19 Science Table was published on their website on COVID-19 vaccination for people with disabilities. ICES contributed to this report by using health administrative-based algorithms to identify individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities as a proxy in absence of self-reported disability data. ICES has um, our own public-facing COVID-19 dashboard as well, where information has been posted regularly throughout the pandemic. The title page shown here can be found by clicking on our website on the Data and Analytics Services tab. Information on this website includes testing, positivity, and outcome and vaccination data by region and demographics, and includes interactive graphs and charts. By scrolling down to the bottom, there are a number of downloadable reports available to the public. Since the fall of 2021, ICS has provided a downloadable report on vaccination in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The screenshot here is circling the link for vaccine coverage in individuals with de developmental disabilities report. And this link has since been updated this past Friday, June 10th, and now includes data up to June 5th, 2022. In this downloadable report, we provide vaccination coverage for individuals with disabilities and then stratify deeper by looking at age groups, sex, geographic regions, marginalization indices, among other characteristics. Here is an example of vaccination uptake, including the number of doses, in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities across age groups. Vaccination uptake in individuals without intellectual and developmental disabilities is also provided as a comparison group. Vaccination uptake is also stratified by public health unit in this report. And as I mentioned, information available on the website was updated, so you can get more recent data um, by clicking the report on our website. And then we also have charts in the report which in this case are showing the increase in third dose vaccination uptake that are also included uh, on the dashboard. And here in this picture, with the highest vaccination uptake is found in the 60 to 69 and 70 plus age groups in those with developmental disabilities, and they reach over 70% for both of those age groups. As I mentioned before, ICES houses health administrative data, which characterize interactions with the healthcare system, such as hospitalizations, emergency department visits, and physician visits. Algorithms have been developed over the years to identify individuals with disabilities using this data in the absence of Ontario-wide self-reported data. So in addition to intellectual and developmental disability algorithms, there's also algorithms that are used for physical and sensory, which include vision and hearing disabilities that have been developed. And through the Applied Health Research Question, or ARC, which I'll elaborate on at the final slide, ICS has been providing COVID-19 related information to the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And this includes testing, positivity and vaccination reports on individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, physical and sensory, and other marginalized populations. Information on this slide shows first and second dose vaccination uptake in individuals with and without a physical hearing or vision disability that was sent to the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And this ministry has further shared this information with the Ministries for Seniors and Accessibility Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and Ministry of Health. Now, while working with the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services, we established a data sharing agreement with the ministry to receive data on social assistance recipients, including the Ontario Disability Support Program, or ODSP. With this data, we've been able to report to the ministry COVID-related outputs with the ODSP population. And this chart is one example of information on the ODSP population showing two-dose vaccination uptake in individuals 
receiving ODSP is the highest in the 60 to 69 and 70 plus age groups at around 85% vaccinated. However, uptake has leveled off in most age groups since February of 2022. Finally, this is not shown in this graph, but uptake is lower in the ODSP population compared to those not receiving ODSP benefits. And this has been a focus of the ministry's work to increase outreach. So I will end the presentation uh, with highlighting the program that has been able that has been used to distribute and disseminate COVID-19 related information at ICES. ICES is one of several research providers in Ontario that answer applied health research questions or ARCs. So an ARC is a question posed by a health system policymaker or provider in order to obtain research evidence to inform planning, policy, and program development that will benefit the broader Ontario health system. ARC projects have been undertaken for the past six or more years, and previous and ongoing ARCs are listed on the ICES website. In addition to viewing what has already been asked, there is also the opportunity for eligible knowledge users that are Ontario-based, publicly funded organizations to submit their own request to seek data to inform health system planning policy and evaluation. And I do encourage organizations to visit the ICES website, which is ices.on.ca. And also I encourage individuals to submit an ARC if there is a knowledge gap, which may be addressed with the data housed at ICES. So I'll open it up for questions. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity for us to present. And I, we also have Yona Lensky, our colleague on the line as well to answer any questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for questions, I see Wendy. Thank you, everyone. And it's nice to see you again, Hillary and Yona. Uh, we have certainly done some work together on this topic. And thank you very much, all of you, for your presentation. Um, my question is uh, related to um, where the City of Toronto sits in the data that you've collected. So as I understand it, ISIS data is derived from Ministry of Health data. Um, and so it's sort of, it's a broader population. But uh, one of the things that we struggle with here at the TAC is understanding where disabled people uh, in the city of Toronto sit in relation to some of the questions uh, that you have uh, covered in your presentation. So um, can any of you speak to that a little bit more and also, uh, can any of you speak to uh, recommendations or thoughts on how the City of Toronto collects data in this context and what, what it should be doing, could be doing uh, to kind of flesh out this picture, maybe a little bit more in the context of Toronto specifically? So this is Yona. Maybe I'll start, Wendy, and then Hillary and Leslie, you can jump in. So, um, you know, for example, we tried to give you different ways we could learn about disability in the pandemic. So we can ask people, and I think in the city of Toronto, maybe they have asked people some questions around disability, perhaps. I, I'm not sure I'm not privy to that, but that would be one way of getting information. You know, with Hillary study as an example, she'll have a subgroup of people eventually from Toronto. And there's other groups studying things where you can just learn about Toronto specific self-reported data. But the the challenge with that is the people have to know there's a questionnaire or they have it has to be accessible to fill out right or they have to be able to be interviewed and we have to know they have disabilities so sometimes when we study people by asking them about their experience we don't capture a report on disability that's the challenge there or we only get certain people so it's biased so the gemini study that hillary mentioned is a way of using hospital data and that was a sort of gta study so those um findings that hillary mentioned were published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, like pretty clear information on who was hospitalized in a certain period of time with COVID, with disabilities and what happened to them. The information that Leslie was talking about in that dashboard, you know, um, the, the, the report specifically for developmental disabilities, if you look at the whole giant Excel chart and we could see about pulling out information, as Leslie mentioned, one was just posted on June, like up to June the 5th that went up last Friday. So we could look at that. We couldn't put that in the slides because we wanted to get things to you at an earlier date. But that has um, the numbers of people who've had one, two, three, four 
vaccines from the Toronto Public Health Unit. So there's a line item on that for people with developmental disabilities and without. It's not broken down by age group or by sex, just in the Toronto Public Health Unit. So it just gives you the overall numbers for the Toronto Public Health Unit. But you can also see, I think, how other public health units are doing in that regard. So that's an ongoing source of information. When we use provincial data from ICES, we can um, focus in on a particular public health unit in that work. And sometimes some of that information is already out there, maybe with public health units or Public Health Ontario. Or you could ask a new question that's more specific through that um, ARC, AHRQ process that Leslie mentioned. I'm just going to say one more quick comment on that, is which I think that sometimes what happens is information is somewhere, but it's not talking to the information somewhere else, right? And I think um, the accessibility community is terrific, but it's not really a health committee per se, right? It's not focused on what's going on strictly around health issues. So what might happen is that when we roll up information around pandemic and health issues, it might not always be going to the accessibility um, committee. And I don't think that's unique to Toronto, um, but that's just my opinion. Thank you, Yana. I can maybe say, oh, go ahead. I apologize. I was just going to add to that. I was going to um, just mentioned a few Toronto related um, uh, based information that's available on the dashboard. Um, there are reports that are downloadable that do look at vaccination coverage by FSA, so forward sortation area, which is the first three digits of a postal code. Um, and so that does get into um, you know, smaller um, regions. And that is across Ontario, but Toronto, of course, would be included in that. And then um, there has been some work uh, that was looking at Toronto neighborhoods specifically. Um, that, again, is, is more um, broad in, in individuals overall, not specific um, to a particular priority group or a disability. Um, but that's kind of the most granular level data we have with regards to um, say Toronto or a, a, a smaller region. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Seeing then any comments? Uh, all right, yes, Michelle, and then Wendy. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my comment is honestly just a, a thank you, uh, a deep thank you, because I work with an organization called Community Living Toronto, and we provide supports and services for people with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And when the vaccine rollout was taking place, we were really thrown by how, how much advocating we had to do to ensure that our community and population had access to vaccines. And having the data to show why this was so important was huge. Uh, and beyond that, having this data when we speak with uh, government officials and have our election priority asks in place and, and advocate for better relationships between developmental services and, and healthcare, it's invaluable. Um, data in our sector can be lacking. It's the most diplomatic way I can put it. And so the work that you do at ICES, and uh, Yona, just a particular thank you because your name comes up in pretty much every meeting when we have to provide data. Uh, I just wanted to express my appreciation and really hope this uh, continues because COVID won't be the last health crisis that we're facing as a community. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Go ahead, Wendy. I'm I'm just exploring the opportunity of a motion here. So I've just uh, emailed um, the clerk and Carol to see if there's something that we could put together here. But I wanted to say thank you to the three of you for coming and providing that information, and also for uh, the focus that you have all had on um, putting this information together. I think, you know, you know, your point around there can be information available, but it doesn't necessarily speak to other information that's available is certainly something that I think we've all been seeing uh, across the pandemic, that there there are that the experience of uh, disabled people in the pandemic, both in terms of the impact of the pandemic, but also 
you know, experiences around vaccinations has been hard to see. And in fact, I think that your group is amongst the only uh, researchers that I know who are producing um, reports about the community of people with disabilities in this context. And, you know, I know that there's quite a lot of data that's available internationally. And certainly the data that you presented from the UK is something I've been aware of for some time, but I'm not sure that everybody is. And I think it's it's a very stark uh, reality check for for us around who has been impacted by the pandemic. I don't think that the narrative that disabled people have been uh, more impacted by the pandemic is actually that clear for most people. And so I think that the work that you're doing is extremely important. And um, I sent a motion, I've sent a request to develop a motion to try to actually um, suggest that you provide this presentation to Toronto Public Health specifically. So I think that, uh, you know, we have been asking Toronto Public Health um, many times at this committee to come and talk to us about what is known about disabled people in the context of the city's own data collection strategies related to COVID-19. We've heard from the three of you around a different kind of data set and what you know and what you have derived, but we still don't know very much about what the city itself uh, understands to be the experience of disabled people in the context of the data that they collect. And so I think perhaps if we can get you together uh, to have a conversation about this, that there could be some really concrete strategies that come out of that for Toronto Public Health itself to expand out their own data collection strategies. So um, to uh, Madam Chair, I, I wonder what our next steps could be as I've got this motion uh, pending. Um, I, I'll leave it to you, but Thanks, thank you Monica. again. And it's lovely to see all of you. Sure, so the clerk is just working on the motion. Um, if there are other comments, uh, we can use that time while clerks works on the, on the motion. Howard, I think you're on mute, but it looks like you were speaking. Now your video is off as well. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> You're on mute again. We heard you for one quick second. I've got nothing more to say. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Yes, um, just in the interest of time, thank you so much, Hillary, Yona, and Leslie. Um, it's my very first meeting, but uh, also um, sitting on the Board of Health, uh, this is really critical information, and I thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, and we'll just uh, hold tight for a second. If I can say one thing, since there's a pause while we're waiting for the motion, um, I would urge you, Leslie showed at the end, you know, how we've been doing, say, around vaccine three, and we know um, if we think about um, how people have experienced the vaccine rollout across the disability community, it has not been ideal. Um, so we should be preparing now. I would use this information. I, I echo or agree with what you're saying around working together with Toronto Public Health, but we can't have another sort of um, let's quickly rush through you know, what happens in the fall, for example, a sort of proactive activity. We know that um, far fewer people have had their third vaccine with disabilities than their second. So, um, and that's both in the ODSP data and in the developmental disability data. So we, we need to do more to educate people on why this is important. Um, and then we need to make sure we can do more around accessibility. So kind of using this data proactively, even though it wasn't always available, maybe as quickly as people would have wanted it is just so crucial. So I'm happy to cheer you on from behind the scenes on that. Thank you. And one other thing is that I really think this is not unique to your accessibility community. So I don't know how much this committee speaks to the other accessibility um, committees in, in different municipalities, but I'm guessing they also don't know. 
I, I kind of assumed it was all one thing, right? And so when we got this question, it was like an aha moment, realizing that the accessibility committees are not um, maybe quite as connected as they could be to what happens in public health. So you may want to also connect with other uh, committees who are experiencing similar issues. for your patience, everyone, just a few more moments. Hi, Wendy. This is Carol. I just wanted to clarify. You want to forward the presentation to the to Toronto Public Health? Or did you hey, say Carol? I think uh, I would like to suggest that we request that this presentation be made to Toronto Public Health. So not just to send the presentation on, but to actually suggest as a committee that uh, Toronto Public Health receives this presentation from the researchers in the same way that we have. Okay, and it's, it's Toronto Public Health rather than the Board of Health you're suggesting? Actually, how about both, Toronto Public Health and the Board of Health? Okay, uh, we'll we'll set it up that way. I just needed to confirm routing and such, so it'll be on the screen in about Thank thirty you. seconds. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Motion is now on the screen. Uh, Wendy, would you like to read it? Thank you. Uh, that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommend that one, the presentation from Hillary Brown, ISIS adjunct scientist, Yona Lensky, ISIS adjunct scientist, and Leslie Pumptree, ISIS staff scientist, be forwarded to the Board of Health and Toronto Public Health. Are there any questions on the motion? I'm not sure that I'm very sorry, and I realize we're at the end of the meeting here. I'm not sure that that captures what I was hoping for. So I, I'm hoping, I, I don't know if I'm articulating this, but I, I think if they receive the presentation as a as an attachment, that's one thing, right? But I think that if they actually, if we see the presentation provided to the Board of Health and Toronto Public Health, that we are helping to broker a conversation about something that has been frankly missing 
uh, from quite a lot of the ways that people are thinking about the pandemic. Um, so, Carol, I don't know if it could be adjusted so that it's not that the presentation is just forwarded, but that uh, that there is an opportunity for these researchers to provide uh, a real presentation of the findings to uh, the folks that have been named here. And I'm very sorry, I know everybody wants to go, but I really think that this is a critical piece of making sure that disabled people are not left out of the equation again and again in the context of the ongoing work that we're going to be seeing uh, happening around vaccinations and COVID. No need to apologize. I think it's really important that we get uh, your intention captured. So Carol's just working on some rewording. We'll get it back up shortly. Thank you. The timing's great, isn't it? The last few minutes of the last meeting before we all break for summer. <laughs> so I'm sorry, everybody, but I do think it's important. It's also your last meeting, right? So I think it's critically important. This is this your last move. It'll be a good one. Thank you. I think we have what you're looking for. If I can get my colleague Jennifer to display the motion. Jennifer, Wendy, is that a little bit closer? Yes, I think that that's that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and did everyone have an opportunity to see the revised wording? I think it should be read out, actually. Yeah. Can we get it back on the screen, please? Do you want me to read it? Go ahead. That the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommend that one, the executive committee forward the presentation from Hillary Brown, ISIS adjunct scientist, Yona Lensky, ISIS adjunct scientist, and Leslie Plumtree, ISIS staff scientist to the Board of Health and Toronto Public Health, and that the presenters be invited to present the information at an upcoming meeting. Are there any questions about the motion for members of the committee? Would anyone like to speak to the motion? All right, seeing no questions or comments, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion carries. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, that was our last item. However, before we end the meeting, I will move a motion to excuse the absence of TAC members who are not able to attend today's meeting. And I'd like to take a moment for some clothing remarks. Uh, first, I'll ask the clerk to display the motion and I will read it out loud. Uh, that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee excuse the absence of Michael McNeely, Liv Mendelson, and Bhuvani um, Sivna Sandurum for the June 13th, 2022 Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting.
All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Um, and members, before we conclude, I would like to uh, thank Glenn Hart, who recently gave notice of his resignation from the committee, and thank him very much for all of his service. And as this is the last hack of the council term, I would just, again, like to thank each and every one of you for all of your service to our city and your hard work and contributions toward making the city of Toronto more accessible. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our business. Thank you, members and staff. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>